Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, March 31st, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And today we got a diary from Jan with an unpatched denial of service vulnerability in Windows Explorer. So not Internet Explorer, but Windows Explorer that you use to look at local files. The trick that he's using here are self-referential link files. Link files usually point to a different files, but well, uh, they can also point to themselves and apparently Windows Explorer has issues with those files. Now, there are two different uh, type of uh, link files. There are URL link files, little text files in INI format, and then there are shell links uh, that are using a binary format. The difference in impact here is that in order to experience the denial of service condition with a URL link file, you actually have to try to open the URL link file with the shell link file. The only thing you have to do is open a directory within which you can find this malicious shelling file. And again, Windows Explorer will crash. Jan did report this vulnerability to Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft uh, decided not to fix it due to the limited impact. Of course, this is really a little bit more of an annoyance in particular, since an attacker would already need the ability to place the file on your system. And of course, over the last couple of weeks, video conferencing has become a lot more popular and there are a number of different solutions that have seen a large increase in their user base. One of the standouts kind of has been Zoom. Zoom has sort of been in startup mode and uh, yes, has uh, been somewhat popular, but really its popularity sort of exploded these last couple of weeks. And with that, of course, also a lot more attention has been paid to Zoom's security and privacy posture. Now I have a couple of stories here about Zoom. I don't want to have to sort of come across as Zoom bashing. Some of these issues are preventable. Others, well, I think are just sort of a result of the increased popularity. One of the issues was at least uh, Zoom's privacy policy. Nobody ever, of course, reads these privacy policies unless you are a lawyer. Luckily, internet privacy advocate Doc Searles read the policy and noted that it is essentially giving Zoom access to all your data, meaning all of your meetings, also allows Zoom to sell the data to advertisers. Now, when I first saw that, I was a little bit surprised because Zoom doesn't really use any ads, but apparently, at least the iOS application did, for example, share some data with Facebook. Now, Zoom updated its privacy policy and also a did add a little uh, preamble by one of the Zoom executives explaining that they're not owning any content that you are creating in any meetings that you operate over Zoom. Zoom also released an updated iOS client without the Facebook tracking. To me, it looks a little bit like a lot of startups that sort of still look a little bit for the right business model, very considered at revenue at one point, but then apparently never really used it. As far as the Facebook tracking in the iOS app, I still uh, would like to hear a better explanation for that. Uh, my assumption is that it may also be sort of some leftover, maybe share that meeting on Facebook code or so that caused this kind of telemetry to be sent back to Facebook. Another sort of privacy related bug in Zoom was uh, the fact that if you exported the chat log as, uh, for example, a meeting transcript, it would include private messages messages between users that uh, they may not necessarily want to have included in meeting minutes. The second problem is uh, probably not so much a problem with Zoom itself, but just uh, with these kind of online meeting rooms in general. And that's if you do have fairly open meetings where everybody can attend, there may be some users that don't behave and essentially denial of service attack at the meeting by 
posting inappropriate content. The real fix here is when you are setting up uh, these meetings uh, to restrict participants appropriately. Now, the FBI's Boston office got involved here and uh, did publish some guidelines in how to use Zoom in particular for online classrooms. A lot of uh, these tips, like for example, restricting the screen sharing options and such uh, make a lot of sense to me. Uh, but uh, then again, we have a lot of people, of course, uh, for them, it's probably the first time that they're conducting online meetings like this. And finally, Checkpoint noted that uh, the number of domain names that include the word Zoom also soared over the last couple weeks from about 20 a day up to a hundred and apparently they're being used to fish zoom credentials also malware likes to use now words like zoom as part of the file name in order to trick users into believing that what they just downloaded is a legitimate zoom client so in short, what we have here is attackers taking advantage of users that are unexperienced with particular software or the medium of these online video conferences. And some user education may, of course, help here. And as usual, a well-configured system should probably not allow a user to launch the malware. And if you're running Zoom meetings, take a look at the write-up by the FBI's Boston office for some of the tips there to prevent some of this Zoom bombing. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.